Hi, everybody. It's such a pleasure to welcome you all to the year-end festivities, an hour of happiness, and the first talk by JC Conrad. Um, we are so honored and excited to have you. Please tell us about living history. So first of all, thank you to Sri and Orit and the rest of the organizers. Today is December 15th, 2021, and my group currently studies two problems in biological transport. We look at viruses moving in complex media and bacteria adhering and moving near interfaces. I started working on biological systems in the summer of 2008. I was a postdoc at the University of Illinois and Gerard Wong approached me about a collaboration with his group, which included then postdoc Vernita Gordon, to look at the motility of bacteria on surfaces. I wasn't working for Gerard though, I was working for Jennifer Lewis, and my goal in her group was to develop colloidal model systems to mimic the flow behavior of the inks used in three-dimensional printing. Jennifer, however, was very gracious about letting me explore new collaborations with Gerard. And the reason that both Jennifer and Gerard wanted to work with me is that I had developed, um, sorry, worked with techniques as a graduate student for imaging and tracking micron-sized particles during my PhD, which was with Dave Waits at Harvard. I joined Dave's group in January of 2000. And I joined Dave's group because when he stood up to talk to first-year graduate students about recruiting, he decided to talk about the physics of toothpaste, which was something I hadn't heard about in the context of my physics classes. So I joined Dave's group and did a thesis looking at the behavior of colloidal gels and glasses. Although at that time I was working on non-living systems, my experience during my PhD uh, was intimately shaped by people working on biological problems. My first two office mates uh, are both distinguished biophysicists, Margaret Gardell and Megan Valentine. And I also benefited from a wide range of interactions with the postdocs in Dave's rapidly growing group, including my first mentor, Eric Weeks, uh, and then later mentors, Dan Blair and Eric Dufresne. I chose to go to Harvard for graduate school because coming out of undergraduate, I wasn't quite certain what kind of physics I wanted to work on. At the University of Chicago, where I did my undergraduate degree, I had done a degree for, uh, I had started my degree in physics and then switched to math. But by the end of my third year in uh, college, I realized that I wasn't a research mathematician. And I had a really important conversation with the math faculty advisor for undergraduates, Diane Herman. She told me it was okay not to be a mathematician and encouraged me to apply to physics graduate school. While I was writing my graduate essays, I thought about different topics. And although I had never worked with or for David Greer, I thought about some of the movies that friends of mine who worked with him were showing. And they were looking at movies of small particles that were moving in solvent on a dark background. And so I included in my graduate statement some comments about potentially working with colloids. And it was likely this statement that led Dave to accepting me as a graduate student. I was able to go to the University of Chicago with a full ride scholarship. This is because during high school, I had done a science, uh, science fair uh, called the Science Talent Search, which is a nationwide competition in the United States. Most of the participants in the science fair had had long-term mentored research experiences. I did not, I was from Oregon, but I had gone uh, to a summer camp where I had a short mentored research experience the previous summer. In the summer of uh, 1994, I attended the Research Science Institute. This was a camp held at MIT that brought together high school students from the US and around the world to live and to work and to talk about science. I had never heard of this program before the fall of 1993, when the principal of my high school came up to me in the hallway and gave me a flyer and suggested that I apply to this camp. And so I applied and was accepted. And I note that, I, uh, uh, that my principal approached me because I was a good student who was genuinely interested in math and science. My parents are not scientists, but I am the child of a librarian. And from a young age, my household included books that talked about math and science. And so I highlight two here that were important for me uh, during, my, uh, during my young years. First, a child's biography of Marie Curie that told the apocryphal story that she became a physicist because she wanted to have physical apparatus like her father. And second, a book of math puzzles and brain teasers that delighted me, okay, even though I loved mathematics. Okay. So I've told a story, it's very linear, about how I became a biophysicist. And like all stories that are too pat and too linear, one should perhaps be a bit skeptical of the story that I've told. Indeed, I've neglected some of the digressions. For example, during my undergraduate years, I worked in an experimental high energy astrophysics group with Renee Ong and Corbin Koval. This is where I learned to write code. While I was visiting graduate schools, 
I talked to various advisors who were interested in me as a student potentially because of the skills that I had developed during that collaboration. But I wasn't certain that I wanted to do high energy astrophysics or astrophysics at all. And so instead I chose and took one path and decided to go to Harvard because it offered me the opportunity to work for any advisors in the Boston area. The linear timeline that I've presented also elides over a number of challenges. And for me, perhaps the most significant challenges are the mental health issues that I've dealt with throughout my career and throughout my life. I suffer from anxiety and depression, and that's part of my living history uh, as a physicist and developing my identity as a physicist. One of the tactics that I've learned over the course of my professional career that's important for me in, man in managing those conditions is to uh, connect to the communities that have been so important for me during my professional development. And so, because my science research camp was important for me to develop an identity as a scientist, to learn about doing research in a university, and to connect to a peer group, I've given back as a counselor, a tutor, and a physics lecturer for this program over a number of years. Likewise, because I was able to explore undergraduate research, because I had a full ride scholarship to Chicago, because I had participated in the na nationwide science fair, I've, uh, and over the last couple of years, I've agreed to serve as a judge for this program uh, to continue that experience for other young scientists. Thinking about my own professional uh, scientific development, communities of soft matter, biophysics and polymer physics have been instrumental in developing my science. And so there I, I choose to give back, for example, by lecturing at summer schools. And perhaps more substantially, when my first mentor, Eric Weeks, approached me in the fall of 2019 and asked if I would be willing to run for office in the division of soft matter and of APS, I thought about it and accepted. And so starting at the beginning of the pandemic um, in March of 2020, I've been working with DSOFT to grow and strengthen the soft matter community. Finally, thinking about the direction that my group has taken over the first 12 years of my independent research career, I show here a picture from my job application statement, which was written in the fall of 2008. At that time, most of my professional experience had focused on colloids which is the top row of these images. And I had just started to talk to Gerard about working with bacteria. I had decided through reading that I wanted to work on questions involving flow and transport. And so I included in my job statement, a speculative set of ideas that suggested that I might continue to extend these, um, these studies to biological particles. And so looking at the work done in my group, some of my trainees have indeed worked on colloidal suspensions. But um, some of my trainees have worked on bacteria as I had anticipated. But because I had done my training work in groups that were vibrant and intellectually diverse, starting with Renee and Corbin for undergraduate, learning about the world of soft matter with Dave, and then moving to different types of topics with both Jennifer and Gerard, I've been able in my own research group to explore a fairly wide variety of, of systems okay, enabled by collaborations at my institution, the University of Houston. And so we've moved down in size scale from colloids to nanoparticles. And on the biological side, from bacteria to viruses to proteins. And then we've also worked on topics that I wouldn't have anticipated in the fall of 2008, looking at topics in soft matter simulation, as well as surface tethered polymers. And again, I emphasize, it's because I was exposed to such a wide variety of topics and interests and in research while I was uh, a trainee that it's given me the intellectual flexibility and curiosity to be able to dive into new collaborations and new topics. And so if I step out of the timeline that I've constructed, moving first backwards and then forwards in time, I wanted to communicate four basic lessons. First, as the child of a librarian, okay. I suggest that you read, right? both to gather information and also to learn how to tell stories. As a practicing physicist, I note that I constantly revise. I come back to questions and systems and ideas. And it's important to be skeptical of stories that are perhaps too linear or too pat or sufficiently uncomplicated. Third, I note that the timeline that I've constructed at the bottom of the screen uh, has arrows that are not uniformly distributed in time. Okay? This suggests that there are particular points at which energy was injected into my system okay? that led to new experiences and new opportunities. And so as somebody who has studied non-equilibrium systems throughout her career, I encourage uh, trainees to think about how they can get out of equilibrium, to explore and be open to new opportunities, new ideas, new collaborators, and new challenges. Finally, as somebody working in microbiology who thinks constantly about cultures and recognizing the importance that my communities have had on my professional development, 
I again encourage you to think about how you can work to culture and build your own communities, the ones that are important to you. And in particular, how you can construct those communities in a way such that individuals from a wide range of backgrounds with different interests and goals can find their niches and thrive. Thank you. On behalf of the audience, thank you so much for that really inspiring talk. Everybody, we have time for a couple of questions. If you have questions, be, please feel free to simply unmute and go for it. Uh, Sonia, I think you have a question, go for it. Um, so uh, I, was, I was mainly just clapping, but I was, I, and I was about to type something in the chat. So I'll, so I'll say it instead of, uh, instead of typing it. I just wanted to um, thank you so much for mentioning um, the fact that scientists are human beings with mental health issues and challenges. Um, as someone who started taking antidepressants in my first year of grad school, I, you know, um, solidarity. <laughs> so, so thank okay. you for mentioning that. Um, I think it's really important. And I'll note that the yes. culture has really changed. Um, mm -hmm. I, I will admit I started therapy as a very young child, right? And have mm -hmm. been in and out. And I think it's something that originally people didn't talk about. Right. And I note that people much younger than me are much more open and much better about bringing this into yeah. common conversation. But it's a conversation I have with my colleagues and my mm -hmm. students. And I think yes. it's really important to recognize that we're, we all have certain kinds of experiences, right? Mm -hmm. These are part of our journeys. Definitely. And, and th that helps also, it helps our students to make them feel safe in, you know, coming to us if they are in a difficult situation. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sonia. Dan, you're next. And then after Dan, Abhinendra. That was a, that was a beautiful and, and kind of humbling talk, actually, <laughs> to hear all the things that you've done to, to give back. One thing I wanted to echo is the, the really the importance of working with high school students. I mean, I was also part of, in a you know, much earlier generation, the, the uh, Westinghouse Science Talent Search. And the people that I met there, I'm still, I'm still in touch with today. I mean, there's so, so my active Facebook friends are, are from that time. And it would just the exposure you get to other kids who are like you in some ways, um, I think can't be, that, that can't be underestimated. I totally agree. It was so formative for me, especially coming out of, uh, you know, a good but ordinary high school, but not one of the ones that had a culture of, of uh, encouraging science or creating these kinds of experiences. Those are so formative. And so when I was asked to serve as a judge by somebody who is an alumnus, both of my STS, and my RSI, I said yes fairly quickly, even recognizing the service burden because it was so important to me. If you find out that they want more judges, please throw my name in there. Actually, please do ping me. They're always looking for judges. If you can ping me with um, uh, some expertise, I'll pass your name on. I'll do that. Great, thanks. Um, final question, Abhinendra, go for it, please. Thank you. Hey, Jesse, this was, hey, this was beautiful. This was really nice. This is so humbling, so inspiring. One thing that I would like to like maybe ask you some suggestion on is how could we think of like bringing the human touch into, I mean, even to science or even into job applications, right? Like when we are thinking about something, it's a human being who gonna work on those things, right? So that's a really, and um, this is a, an interesting question that I think about a lot because um, as a female scientist, I've been on every search committee in my 12 years, <laughs> including uh, multiple search committees per year in multiple departments. One thing that I've noticed that's different from when I wrote my own job applications is that there is a focus for many schools, including my own, on understanding how faculty will contribute to the broader development of students and recognizing that the student population um, is quite diverse, okay? And that's a reflection both of students um, coming from outside the US, a broadening of the talent pool in the, inside the United States, and a recognition that past systems perhaps have not served many of our students well. And so I think one way to bring in some of that human element is to critically engage with the idea that you will be working with students from an extraordinarily wide range of backgrounds and to think both about the commitments that you've made as a person and the commitments that you will make. And I say this because this is something that I, I typically look for and ask for when I'm running faculty searches. But I think really critically reflecting with that idea is one way to start to bring the human element into science. There are likely others, but it's one that comes to mind quickly. Thanks. This was really beautiful. This was very nice. This was a fun talk to put together. I've never done one like this. <laughs>
So again, so much, so many thanks. This is a wonderful initiative. I also have watched everyone online. And so it's just really amazing to be a part of it. It makes it even more humbling that this is the first time you've given this talk. I was so, so beautifully organized. I maybe spent a little bit too much time <laughs> thinking about how I wanted to structure it, right? Um, and also, yeah, I, I read too many books. So I wanted to think think about something a little bit nonlinear to think about how we tell stories. Yeah, so, that, again, was, that, really was, that was phenomenal, JC. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I'm, I'm glad that you're saying this because for me, it felt very um, experimental and it was really a lot of fun to put together. So again, uh, so many thanks to the organizers. I love this initiative. I am so, I'm so grateful to be able to, to watch the other stories. And I do watch them every time a new Aliquot comes out. Oh, I love it. Thank you so much. Um, okay. And thank you, thank you for the kind words as well. This was such an open, humanizing, and therefore inspiring talk. Thank you also for all the conversations you've now opened and made possible uh, in the interest of time. I am closing the recording. <laughs>